Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited to see you all. Um, this is the week six of the second season of the Pacific Division Sheltering Capacity Building Series. My name is Yi Wei. I'm a volunteer that joined in 2009. I am the Pacific Division Training Event Planner, and I'm also the Mass Care Regional Program Lead in Los Angeles. So this is a session that I invite all the subject expert, subject matter expert from across the region, across the division to talk about anything shelter related or masculine related. So this meeting will be recorded. It will be sent out later on um, along with the slides. It will also get posted on YouTube. You're able to search that as well. So we will have approximately 15 sessions total with the most requested topics from all of you. Um, each session will have the same link. Uh, you will have recordings afterwards as well. You're able to search on YouTube. It will be the Red Cross Pacific Division on YouTube. Your camera and a mic for the time being have been disabled because we do have a large group. You're able to type your questions in the chat in the meantime, and towards the end when we open for Q and A's, you're also able to come off mute. So we have several goals for this division series. Number one is to really build our workforce confidence. I really want to incorporate everything that we learned from Hurricane Ian or other disasters or California floods into our local operations so we can work better and function better. It's also to provide practical tips. It's something different than edge courses because edge courses, they're usually either instructor led or they're recorded. But this one, we're really going down to the specific topics we want to talk about, which today is going to be shelter resident transition. Um, the third one is we want to provide a collaborative environment across all functions, whether you are sheltering or feeding or whether you are reunifications, which is one of the most important one in the function as well, or staff services or information planning. We want to incorporate all of, you know, to provide a collaborative environment for all of the functions. We also want to provide a network opportunities for all of you. That's why I encourage you all to type your name and the regions you're from in the chat. I'm really happy this season that we're seeing more folks and we're seeing a variety of folks, whether you're from um, Pacific Islands or you're from Northwest or you're from our neighboring regions, Nevada or uh, Nevada or Texas or, you know, all the way East Coast across the nation, I'm really glad that we're able to host this environment. And another goal of mine is to really to have a different presenter and also a different host or moderator for each session so we can give each territory or region an opportunity to host so we can increase our local volunteer engagement. So today um, we're having Cynthia Fisher, which she is a volunteer from Central California region. She's our Pacific Division Shelter Resident Transition co-lead. And shelter transition, shelter resident transition is relatively a new function that we have. So I'm really interested what she's going to share with us today. So Cynthia, it's all yours. That's tonight. Oh, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Yue, um, and thank you, everybody, for jumping on tonight. My name is Cynthia Fisher, and I have been a volunteer with the American Red Cross since 2010. And I have primarily focused in mass care, working in sheltering and the feeding along the California coast with the different fires over time. Um, more recently, in the last few years, I have uh, spread my wings into shelter resident transition work and have found a beautiful home there for me. So I hope tonight that I'm able to share that information with you uh, and that I can relay a little bit about what shelter resident transition is, what they do, um, the type of work that is going on to help clients and to help you see whether you're in sheltering or feeding or logistics, how shelter resident transition may work with you and how it helps the clients. So I'm gonna take pauses tonight. I'm gonna give opportunity. Um, Yue, she's gonna be my awesome moderator. So if you uh, have any questions and you wanna just kind of fill it in, I'm gonna take pauses and breaks. I'm trying not to give you too much information, um, but really focus on where people's questions have been. So I'm going to turn my camera off so that you don't have to see all the weird faces that I am intending to make to keep my um, 
my roll through all of the slides, but uh, here we go. So shelter resident transition is one of the seven mass care activities that we currently have. Um, so what is SRT? If you're a shelter worker, why is SRT important to you? So that is the number one question that we wanna answer for you all tonight. What is the SRT caseworker? What is the background of the, the workers in shelter resident transition? What kind of things do they do for the clients? And how do they help shelter workers or how do shelter workers help SRT caseworkers? So all of these questions and probably some more that I don't have on my list that you all come up with, I intend to go over tonight. SRT is part of client first sheltering. The emphasis with SRT is focusing on individual client needs. We're sh sheltering supports the individual as well as the affected community. Where client recovery is supported by all Red Cross workers. Shelter resident transition is just one of those components that you're going to find in a shelter. The caseworkers gather information, put it into a formal package in RC Care, and that information provides situational awareness to the disaster relief operational leadership. To, it helps create operational priorities, which set where the shelter should be, how soon should they close. It helps allocate resources. Uh, maybe we have higher needs in one shelter and through the data that's collected, that communication is reinforced at the DRO leadership level. It might help us engage a housing liaison, someone who can help identify housing that's going to benefit the clients if they have lost their housing. It also helps us engage government and community organizations once those needs have been identified. Through shelter resident transition casework, they advocate and support the shelter residents so that their transition from a shelter is more secure, more housing secure, more food secure, and more health secure. And those solutions are built, they're advocated for, they're supported, and it's a client's plan on how to get out of the shelter. So let's take a little deeper dive in what that looks like. One of the questions earlier on was how do they help, how do they, the shelter resident transition caseworkers, help shelter workers, and what do shelter workers do to help them? So here's an overview of what happens inside an American Red Cross shelters. So it begins with a level four and above event. And level three, by the request of the regional officers to put in a national request to have SRT show up at a level three event. So yes, always on a level four event, sometimes on a level three event. When clients have faced significant housing losses and are unable to return to their pre-disaster homes, the idea is that shelter resident transition team will come in and help start building the bridge for those gaps. It is under the management of the operations branch, the mass care team or the mass care chief at the headquarters, the SRT team will deploy alongside sheltering teams as shelter in shelters, sorry, to assist residents by identifying those factors that may prohibit a client from leaving a shelter. Once we've identified those barriers or also known as roadblocks, the disaster relief operation is able to identify resources to address clients' needs and aid them in their transition from the shelter. How are we doing? Any questions? Cynthia, you mentioned um, you mentioned the different levels. Are you able to just to give us an idea or example of what does level three mean or what does level four mean? Or your most experience with whether it's Hurricane Ian or California floods? You know how how do that play into into the levels and also the SRT, the shelter resident transition? 
thank you for asking. That is a great question. So typically, um, disaster responses are built into levels of participate uh, a financial commitment to to the recovery. Um, we register them from a level one to a level seven, and I'm sorry, I'm not versed in where those thresholds are, but you can sit as a as a volunteer with the Red Cross and kind of get a feel for that, right? So if you have a house fire, that is a DAT call. You're going to respond with your DAT team. That is really the first level of response that we have in the Red Cross is that DAT team going out there. They're the first face of the Red Cross, and they're the first ones to start to bring the resources financial and, and just the, the compassionate care that volunteers bring to clients who are suffered disasters. So thank you, disaster action team, yes. Um, so level one and two, you're gonna start to get up in a two, you may be looking at a large apartment complex, um, large in some areas may mean 12 units, in other areas it may be 45, but somewhere in there, you're going to start to find that shift in the dollar amount that we're giving to families, how many families are affected, what are the total needs, of those families and then what does that cost look like to the Red Cross as we hit those thresholds and we step up into what is considered a level three event it starts to question do we have the capacity at a local level so you and I who are signed up as volunteers to respond to a shelter event locally um, we deploy in an emergency event and most of us are on standby right now for this weekend so we're standing by, but maybe we don't have the capacity to carry on beyond a few days, and, and this becomes a larger event. That's really the next three, and, and level four becomes even a national response, where you're, you're not just the local community responding, you're the region responding. So we have our little hubs, our little counties, our territories, our chapters, Right. And we build it out. We build out from the chapter to the region and then to the region. We have the state and then beyond the state, we have the division. And that's the same way across the United States. So that's how the Red Cross is. But once we get into that three and four level, we're really looking at what are the needs of the clients? Are they just displaced because it's an evacuation or did a flood come through and, and wipe out? literally hundreds of homes that all hundreds of these families need help getting housing. So we're gonna look at it on what is the need of the client. When we get to a five or seven, those national operations, which some of you deploy to, some of you stay local, both are needed. But when you get to a national event, thousands of people are displaced. Hundreds and hundreds of homes are, are damaged, and even thousands, like um, Hurricane Ian, thousands of homes. <laughs> and, and it's across the state, so it's a huge geographical area. It's a huge number of households that are affected, and the, the, the response is a, a large level seven event. Um, unfortunately, the last few years, we've had several back-to-back level seven events. And that gets into um, needing to make sure that our workforce is trained, that as volunteers, you you all know what SRT is, because you A, may need it at your territory, and B, you may respond to it on a national event and never had needed it at a local chapter uh, response, but all of a sudden the SRT people are there in a national event um, so bringing you the familiarity of what SRT is, what it means, um, gives you the, the comfort level of who you're working with when you get into these larger level four, five, six, and seven events. And that is normally where you will see SRT stand up. And Seth, thank you for dropping that level of financial assistance in the um, chat and Ben too. Thank you. Hey, Cynthia, we have one more question, then we can move forward. Karen's asking, do the shelter resident transition workers, do they stay in the shelter? Do they stay with a client shelter, staff shelter, or where do they stay? We sleep where the rest of the staff sleeps. So if the staff is in a staff shelter, we stay in a staff shelter. If the staff is in a, in a um, 
a hotel or, or apartments, we stay in those hotels and apartments, whatever the staffing availability is. Um, the last few years, the attempt has been to be in, non, in a um, non-congregate environment, um, AKA hotel rooms. Um, but I have spent <laughs> Christmas Eve <laughs> in a staff shelter with a hundred or two of my closest volunteer friends. So it, it's it's everywhere. It's wherever we can get a good night's sleep. Perfect. Thank you so much. We can move on. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's me. So what services are, are available? In SRT, Shelter Resident Transition, it means that we look at every aspect of a client and what their needs are. And every time we look at a client, we look at them equitably in what our services are that we're bringing to them. The primary primary um, resource that we have are referrals. It's, it's what we bring to that client that represents everything of we, meaning we, the Red Cross brings to that client. So our services don't matter about whether or not their house was damaged. It matters whether or not they're in the shelter. So there is no damage assessment. There's no uh, major destroyed. There, there's no, you are only minor and your house was destroyed. It is, you are in our shelter and we are here to help care for you. So our referrals, the services, the referrals that we give, primarily start with the internal referrals to our IDC or our individual disaster care team. Um, that team is consistent, uh, uh, consists of the disaster health teams, the disaster mental health teams, the disaster spiritual care teams, the um, uh, DI teams. Uh, it could even be uh, ICC teams for uh, integrated condolence care. We're, we may need to work with any of those teams within our internal organization. And so they're called internal referrals. And we will refer to somebody if they're having a really bad day and need somebody to talk to. We may call up a spiritual care team member and, and put that in as a referral to the client. Um, External referrals look like organizations like Goodwill, Salvation Army, United Way, Samaritan's Purse, Crisis Cleanup, Team Rubicon, Catholic Charities. If you are a volunteer locally, you will likely see one of these branches for your local community. And I like to encourage you to always try to be in a relationship with these organizations in your local community. Because you're volunteering as a local team member, um, when crisis happens or disaster happens in your community, good relationships matter with these organizations. So spending time building that doesn't hurt anybody, but we definitely use it in the large event through an, a branch called external relations team or go government operations team or community engagement and partnership teams. Um, those are all gaps that you can get and they all work with building these relationships and utilizing these relationships that are, are in a national program um, on an individual event. When a household can return home, the SRT caseworkers help connect um, those households to cleanup companies. So crisis cleanup, Team Rubicon, we might make the referral to them and get them in right away. Um, we might be able to support with construction supplies. Sometimes Samaritan's Purse is out there rebuilding. Um, we even have the government operations team working at a disaster relief operation. They may be able to get us in with the, the planning departments to get the permitting fees um, expedited, or they may have some resources to get permitting fees waived. So it's the SRT's person, that person, that caseworker, it's their job to kind of know who all these people are and what these resources are and to talk to the client and find out what they need. Um, we sometimes help clients have experienced loss of income to help them pay for food or help pay for rent or utilities or find partners 
who can help with that. So based upon the client's um, defined shelter needs or their transition plan, the SRT caseworker will then work with them to get them um, home and close those gaps to help them maintain and sustain their living situations. Now, I, I, I say that these are the services that are available, but we don't always know um, what the ser services are needed. Um, sometimes closings of shelters happen really fast and we count on um, shelter team or the, the IDC team to be in communication with the SRT caseworker about that client because it, you might see things at night that present themselves as something important that the caseworker should know that will help the client in their recovery. So seeing where we take the client and what the resources are that we work through, and these are just a really small picture. Um, if any of you like Excel spreadsheets and putting data together, I have a job for you in um, resource management. So let me know, hit me up, and we'll get you going on that across the United States because there's so many, there's hundreds of tabs in a spreadsheet of potential resources that are available within a given county or within a state. And um, it is one of the biggest things that we do is work with resource management. Um, so any questions on that? Cynthia, not on that specifically, but something that we always would like is, you know, because shelter resident transition team is so new to us, it came out probably, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. Can you just walk us through a typical day for someone that is going to deploy in um, SRT shelter resident transition team, whether a virtual option is, you know, um, which we'll call available or whether that you have to be on the ground in person? I know you deployed to Hurricane Ian several times. So can you just walk us through a little bit, you know, so you can ping the ding for us? Yeah, um, so you can deploy both in person and virtually with this work. Um, right now, you would what you would do is you would, of course, check in like you do to any other gap that you would be assigned to at the disaster relief operation. You check in and you'd get your assignment. Typically, an SRT caseworker is going to go to a shelter, and at the shelter, there will be a team. Um, so there will be casework teams that will work with the clients, and there will be an SRT supervisor there. Um, I'll get into that, how that um, the table of organization or the hierarchy and who works for who, because I know that's a loved question. <laughs> Who's who and who answers to who? I've got you covered on that. I got a slide for that, okay? Um, I'll start with the basic split. Okay, what is the difference between a recovery caseworker and SRT caseworker? And this separation is just a really quick identifier because they both have the name casework in their name. So uh, recovery is a primary for clients that are outside of a shelter. So they're working with everybody in the community. And you know as well as I do that in these large events, or even in these small ones, more people are in the community that are, that are in the shelter. Um, most of the time, the, the clients in the shelter really don't have uh, other options. So shelter resident tr transition, they have a specialty track, and I'll give you some information on that at the end. Uh, they work within the shelter and they work with shelter-only households, so nobody can present from the community and say, I want to open up an SRT case because we won't do it. They have to be residents in the shelter, and we primarily provide referrals, advocacy, and SRT financial assistance. When we provide assistance to a client, it is not, again, dependent upon a DA. In recovery, their financial assistance is under immediate assistance, and that is dependent upon DA. So they have to have a major or destroyed status of their property in order to qualify for immediate assistance. And I'm going to skip on because I know you guys are begging on this next question. So I'm going to talk about the bigger the bigger picture. Why why SRT? Where where did this kind of come into play? So there's a bigger picture here in play. Um, we have had in 2021 alone 
40% of Americans lived in counties that was struck by a climate disaster. So community adaptation is something that is coming into play because we're looking at continuous disasters. Over the last decade alone, um, disasters have displaced more than eight and a half million people from their homes. When these families are forced from their homes by disaster, they tend to be displaced longer. Um, they have an increased risk of poverty and they suffer from worsening chronic housing, hunger, and health challenges. Um, so how SRT fits into the community adaptation, we're looking at the outcomes of keeping people in their homes. So our, our hope is that caseworkers will be able to build the relationship back into the community resources that a client needs to go back into their home, that they don't just leave because there's some damage that grows into huge damage or they leave the home altogether because they don't have the capacity to rebuild. We want to improve those conditions for them that are displaced from their homes or choose to go back and live in damaged homes. We, we want to help them not have to be in that living environment. So this is why we've implemented like the every shelter, every day, every need tactics in the sheltering program, right? So all of the DRO leaders are in on this and SRT, um, when needs are identified, those workers share clients' needs with shelter workers so that individual families, they're all supported while staying in the shelter. So we work together collaboratively with the feeding team, with the sheltering team, with IDC, everybody to get people back into their home. If a client spends less time in a disaster shelter and is quickly placed into a rapid rehousing program, for example, and they need um, what we call wraparound services, um, that might mean that they need food assistance or they need um, access and functional needs assistance. We also refer to that as AFN, access functional needs. Um, It helps the community because we put people back into sustainable housing more quickly. So by reducing the number of families that can't go back or, or fall into a lesser um, food, housing, or med med medical state because of the disaster, by reducing that number that falls, we're really helping the community and putting the community back on all of its feet as quickly as possible. So we're 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 planning, we're coming in with the referrals, we're we're working with the full recovery of the community alongside everybody from the the government ops all the way down to working in the shelter and helping the client at their very core where they are. So we're just a, a small cog in the wheel of everything that's going on, but SRT's fallen under community adaptation and, and the, the goal of growing, how do we get clients who've lost everything that are in a shelter, not just out of a shelter and transactionally put them back someplace, but help them get on their feet again before they leave the shelter or when they leave the shelter, that they have a solid plan. It may not be the best thing, but for the next year, they they know that that's their their choice their place and and that helps them secure rebuilding their lives after that so how does it look yeah, we have two questions if oh, you can address sorry. it real quick that yes. jean is asking shelter resident transition is it a specialty track within the recovery caseworker gap or is yes. it so can you not have a recovery case work gap? Can you be a disaster health services, services yes. associate or disaster mental health you know, to be it to get the specialty track? Yes. Yes, all of that. <laughs> and I have a slide for that at the end too, Jean. Great. And the other one, as you mentioned at the very, very beginning, is that you said shelter resident transition is one of the seven massacre activity, activities. Uh, what are the other six massacre activities? 
Oh, you ain't Karen. You you all are gonna make. I'm gonna ask you all to put it in the chat. What do you think the seven mass care activities are? I only know. I four. don't see anybody typing. I I, I only, I only know four. So so we'll get back to it. You can continue nope, if anyone you know. Just go ahead and put into into the chat. What do you think the you know the seven one of the seven? So what do you think the other six activities are? There you go. There's there there's the people. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, safe and sound feeding, emergency supplies. There you go. Good job. See, you all know so much. You all should be doing this slideshow presentation or be the moderator next time. See, you may they knew. They knew. So I think so, our question is more if we thought mask here only has four functions as in sheltering, feeding, distribution of um, emergency supplies and also reunification, the additional um, shelter resident transition team, that's five. We didn't know what the other six, what the other two were since we were seeing seven. OK, shelter resident transition, sheltering, feeding. We have um, distribution of emergency supplies, reunification. And um, oh, so IDC would fall under mass care in a, a smaller event. And is uh, the the 3E, is that logistics now or is that? So, OK, you got me on that. I don't know the seven. Right. OK, <laughs> so, so 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 I think I will put five, uh, one of the five instead of one of the seven, because um, E3, which stands for every day, every shelter, every need kind of falls under logistic. It doesn't fall under um, sheltering. I mean, doesn't fall under mass care and also um, IDC, the um, individual disaster care that falls under operations. They have a separate group instead of mass care, but we can touch on that later. You can proceed with your activities with your operational phases. Yeah, that'll that'll um, teach me to trust somebody else giving me information to put on a slide, right? I better know that answer. Thanks. Thank you all. Keeping me honest here. So SRT activities during the operational phase, um, you know that when we have an operation that it goes from initiating to stabilization to sustainment to demobilization. So as a client arrives at the shelter, they go into dormitory registration. They'll conduct the C-MIST, the SRT triage, casework, all starts after that. Then the client departs the shelter and we close. So I love we used acronyms. Can you just touch real quick the C-MIST? Or that we can sure. put into the into the one that you know what a CMIS for, or if you can just explain real quick what CMIS does. Yes. So I apologize to all the health professionals as I answer this. Um, the CMIS comes on the backside of what we knew as the registration form this last year. The CMIS are questions, um, and somebody better put this in the chat so I can cheat off of you. Um, it's the client's mobility. Well, you, 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 yeah, you can't put a link in there because I don't have time to look at a link, Melissa. I can't cheat that much. Um, it, it's about a client's basic health. So it is their ability, their ability to talk, their um, their their ability to walk, any medications that they need, um, any immediate services that they need. It is a it's a quick rundown of some very important information that is going to help us give the best experience to a client who is landing in a shelter. Um, if there are emergency situations that come up, um, we can possibly know that that's coming up because of information that a, a client may have given us in, in the registration sheet on the back on the CMS. Uh, those are completed within 24 hours once a client gets to a shelter, and they're typically filled out by your health services team or assigned team members um, at the direction of the shelter site manager to conduct those females. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Connie. 
So we have SRT comes in at the initiating phase, usually on a level five and above. These are deployed at the stand up of your of your initial teams in the um, operations center. You'll get team members out into the shelter as quickly as possible. Um, that some of that is going to be based upon the information that's coming in in this phase. So some of the initial triage information that is gathered helps the DRO leadership deploy the SRT activity into the shelters. Um, but as we've all learned, they open and close really quick. It's hard to get the SRT team to follow behind. So sometimes you might see them stand up when the shelter team stands up. And sometimes you might see them come in a little bit later, especially if it's like for, um, forest fires and they're under evacuations. They may wait to see a little bit longer um, if people are able to start returning home without damages. So how does it all look? With the, with the shelter site, with an SRT organizational chart, this is what it kind of looks like. So you know that the, the king at the, at the show or the queen at the show is the shelter site manager. They are over everybody. What they have to say is the final word. Everybody responds to them. At the end of the day, at that site, everybody that's at that site is the responsibility of that shelter site manager. So the shelter site manager is going to have supervisors underneath them. So one of the supervisors is an SRT supervisor, and you usually have like a registration supervisor and a dormitory supervisor, and then you probably have feeding and all of that going on. But they're all answering to the shelter site manager. Now, under each supervisor, you're going to have your own little team. So for SRT supervisor, you're going to have a, a team of SRT caseworkers. And under registration, you have the registration caseworkers in the dorm, et cetera. So how it works, SRT is going to work with the dorm supervisor, and the SRT is going to work with the registration supervisor. Um, caseworkers are going to work with all of the, the shelter workers, whether registration or dormitory. For example, an SRT caseworker might communicate with the registration desk that they need to identify a client or look at a CMIST on the registration form to get information regarding a client that they're trying to work with. Um, for another, they might have a caseworker might ask a dormitory team member to find help find a client that they maybe haven't met yet that they want an introduction to, or maybe to talk to you just about a client, to find out have you interacted with this client? What do you know about them? So they're trying to help build the case and familiarity before they um, interact with the client completely. But together, they're working with you to find, find a solution for the client. Any questions, sir? Not so far in the chat, but I do have a question on the um, on, you touched on the initiation phase earlier and when SRT will come in. And when we were deployed to Hurricane Ian, we have a lot of people asking, well, when will SRT come in, shelter resident transition team come in? So my question to you is, is it OK to assume or is it reasonable to assume that SRT will show up? Let's say it's Hurricane Ian when you have post landfall. Is it okay to assume that um, SRT will come right after post landfall? Or do you think that it'll take additional probably three or four weeks for everything to set do settle down a bit before we can start SRT? So it should be immediate after a hurricane. Um, I would say maybe a fire a little bit slower. Um, so normally SRT will not deploy pre landfall, but should be there, especially in a in a category five type of hurricane event, should be there in the first wave of deployment that happens. Um, there should be an SRT headquarters manager who should be guiding that um, at the stand up of the operational leadership teams. So there should be somebody in the the leadership team that has the letters SRT attached to their name on the IAP that you all learned about the other day. So look for that person if you have a question and you can ask them. But the shelter manager should be notifying the, 
the sheltering team at headquarters and the mass care team will be helping make sure that all of that is happening. So you're all one team and you're all talking and I've got 200 people at my shelter and a hundred of them lost their homes. So had to be boated out of the, um, out of their neighborhood. So in, in those environments, we know immediately that we're going to need a higher level of service. So communication is really important just to ask for it. If you're not seeing it, ask for it, ask why you don't see it and keep asking for it, especially if it's a need because communication is a must. And especially in these large, large events, things, Things can get um, distracting as you're standing up a large event, um, but they should be at the beginning. Got it. So what I'm hearing is that even though you might not be able to see the shelter resident transition team on the ground, there is already a person in the headquarters managing all those and they're going to plan out. So then when we get more information and when it's after landfall, when it's safe for all the incoming workers to, you know, for us to receive the incoming workers, we will have SRT on the ground, right? Right. Perfect. Thank you. And we have 20 minutes left. Copy that. Thank you. So this is just a diagram showing the client is our goal and we are all working together to kind of support that client, collaborate on that client's success of leaving the shelter. Some of the other people that SRT collaborates with um, is, <laughs> and um, that is not showing, so interesting. Um, but it's going to be the GovOps, it's going to be your external relations, it's going to be the IDC, it's going to be logistics, it's going to be trans, um, the staffing team, it's going to be, it is everybody, it is not just the sheltering team, but for this, um, why, do, why does SRT need to collaborate with the shelters? It's because you're all working on the, the compassionate care of that client. So we want to make sure that that client is receiving everything that they can. By the SRT team coming in, the sheltering team can very much focus on being compassionate caregivers to the clients and focusing on the sheltering the activities that are going on. So one of the things, yay. Oh, you can see it? So Cynthia, I think if you keep continue clicking the forward arrow, you should be able to see it. Ah, uh, thanks. <laughs> Lebet, you got you got my you got all my things there. Look at you. There you go. So that's that's who we're collaborating with. So thank you for that. SRT and housing liaison. Um, housing liaison is a new new factor that's coming in to support SRT. You won't see much of them, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I do want you to know that they exist. The housing liaison's purpose is to support SRT finding housing outside of the shelter. So they're working with the um, mission adaptation team. So where we've st stood up the CAP, the community adaptation programs, um, Lake County and Butte County in California have been the first to stand these up. Um, we've been able to work on really deep relationships within the communities, and those are, are stood up year round versus just coming in to during a disaster relief operation. The housing liaison is a, a new one that's just going to give a lot of different positions a piece of the information. So they're going to be more uh, talking to the government ops and CEP and EOL. <laughs> yep. I said all of those initials. <laughs> so uh, the, the focus here is that they're going to work at a higher level to bring resources down to our level. And there's this organizational chart that we're asking about. So how does this look up in the operational? So the housing liaison, they're up there in the operational level. So we looked at the, the chart for the SRT in the shelter. This is the chart for SRT at headquarters. So we have an SRT manager, we have a sheltering manager, and we have a feeding manager. They all respond to the mass care chief. This is all under the direction of the response team under the AD of operations. So this is the chain of command. There is a invisible line 
for resources and other information that needs to collaborate with recovery. But the mass care chief is the one who's um, going to do the reviews, um, be responsible for this person's review, who is the DRO SRT manager. And then we have, how does the housing liaison fit in and how do specialty tracks fit in? So specialty tracks for casework, specialty tracks for SRT management and specialty tracks for housing liaison. There is a chart and it's called DCS qualifications and specialty tracks that was sent out to you in the links yesterday. Um, and to be an SRT caseworker, you need an SRT specialty track. To be a SRT supervisor or SRT manager, you need a SRT management specialty track and training. To be an S, I'm sorry, an HQ housing liaison, you need a housing liaison specialty track. So to find more information on that, you can click into this um, exchange document and look at all of the great different tracks that are there. But you can see as we build up, we're staying consistent that everything is under mass care and going up to the AD of operations. Housing liaison, though, is going to respond to an external relations leadership role. Okay. So. You want to be an SRT team member? Great, we welcome you. We've simplified the qualifications in the description. So it was one full page, now it's down to half a page. I had to expand it so you could read it. But IDC, CMH, DHS, DSC, um, as long as you have RC Care user role, uh, you have the basic gap requirements. Shelter resident transition fundamentals and sheltering fundamentals are both required. And then you just have to want have a, a want to be a, a SRT caseworker. If you want to add this onto your mass care gap of sheltering, we welcome you. And, and really RC care is not that hard. But if you don't want to work in computers, I don't recommend it for you because you do need to work in computers. So again, here are the links to uh, review the shelter resident transition toolkit and the links regarding the qualifications for the specialty track. Once you've kind of looked at all that, gotten your courses, you want to talk to your disaster workforce engagement team to request the specialty track be added. Um, and, and you can also have them um, talk to you by emailing srt at redcross.org. And that is my presentation. What questions do you have for me that I cannot answer now? <laughs> thank you so much, Cynthia. And before we jump into questions, thank you so much for presenting. Before we jump into questions, I do want to make several announcements and you so we can, you know, before everyone jumps off. So the next session, which is again, same time, same link, we're going to talk about promotion process. And I think that's one of the biggest piece is that once we get you deployed, we always want, want to promote people and we want for everyone to understand what the promotion process is. So we're going to have a subject matter expert coming with us next week um, to talk about promotion process. And also in several weeks, we're going to have a panel discussion about how to handle difficult situations. I mean, we've all been told that if you have a difficult situation, go ahead and contact a supervisor. But what if you are the supervisor? What if you get promoted or feel promoted to a supervisor? What do you do? So we are going to talk about that. And I encourage you to put your topics or anything that I want to discuss in the chat. We already have several topics that people submit questions for. I welcome you to email me. So, you know, if there is anything that you want us to address, you know, as a panel to talk about how to handle difficult situations. I also want to let you know that for the email that I sent out, I've included additional resources. That is all the different toolkits that we have, the specialty track that Cynthia talked about, um, the incident action plan where you can find in disaster operations coordination por portal, center portal, the doc portal, and also the massacre webinar is going to happen every third Thursday of the month at 2 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. So we have all the resources that I'll be sending out um, with attachments that you're able to see. So now we get to questions. Um, we have one um, 
Melissa made a very, very good comment that when we were talking about post landfall and pre landfall, those only apply to hurricanes. They don't apply to wildfires and earthquakes, which were prone in California or the Pacific uh, Pacific Division. So when you have wildfires, Cynthia, if you can just walk us through briefly, how long does it take or you know what is because I think the biggest piece is we don't know what to expect and when we don't know what to expect we get a little you know scared we don't know what to do so can you just walk us through the, the biggest difference for SRT in wildfires earthquakes versus in hurricanes so for wildfires Melissa the, the point is is great um wildfires can start really small, right? It could start as a DAT response um, and, and they could grow quickly or they could grow slow. So the sheltering team is going to be talking to the client and hopefully there's some information flow that's starting to come in and we'll get some sense of whether there are homes damaged in a general capacity. We may not know if we have those clients in the shelter but as we start to learn that there's damages and, and the reports start coming in, the, the readiness of the SRT team is, is already there to stand up. Um, I recommend that, that regions talk about standing up SRT even without financial assistance at a level three, even if it's just for practice. But if, if it's a wildland fire that there are limited evacuations and limited people in the shelter, there may be limited need to have um, the response. And so that gets into those levels, right? So until we get that kind of feel about what this level might be looking at in anticipation, um, if we are in a fire that's raging and it's intruded onto a community, we know that that's likely a larger level four and above event. And so the response should be immediate to have SRT in place. And that would mimic with the immediacy for a hurricane or tornado touchdown. Um, so that idea of immediacy is as soon as we know we have large damages, we should be there. Um, if you don't see it and you think that it's needed, that is your volunteer right to have that conversation up with your shelter supervisor as a sheltering person. Talk to your shelter supervisor. Maybe we should get SRT. Have we talked about SRT? And they're like, no, I don't know. Let me run it up. So they'll run it up. And so as you're asking these questions, or maybe you have 15 people who lost, they know they lost their homes. And you could be saying, hey, I already know we have 15 people lost their homes. Can we get SRT in there? So be asking for it if you don't see it. But it should be automatic. By the time we're at a dollar level for a level four, it should be there. Level three, I'd say start looking for it. Does that answer? Thank you so much, Cynthia. I think, you know, you give us a brief overview of what's going to happen. And so, you know, um, Anthony is asking a very, very good question is how do we get training? I think it's worth to address that um, if you're a volunteer on a local level, so the first person you will reach out to will be the disaster program manager or disaster program specialist, and they will be working with the training coordinator or the disaster workforce engagement manager to coordinate training. And if you're having trouble to get trainings, then of course, we have our division training team, that's myself and Luke and also Melissa on board as well, then we have more people that we can get you the training that was needed. Then once you complete the training, Cynthia, can you touch on real quick that who approves the specialty track? So let's say everyone, you know, they took the class, they took the shelter resident transition fundamentals, they took the shelter fundamental version two, they also have the group activity position for the specific, then then your request, then what do they do next to get the specialty track? So your disaster workforce engagement team should reach out to the SRT team at national and the national will add the um, track to your, to your profile. Um, if your region reaches out to your division, the division workforce engagement leads could do it as well. Pretty simple. 
Thank you so much. I think oftentimes we say pretty simple because we know exactly what to do, but I think on the practical end, when people actually do it, it becomes very, very difficult because they really don't know who to reach out to. Um, I do want to, you know, take this opportunity to give the special shout out, a special thank you for Maria Luz to be on the call with us. She is the regional disaster office from officer from Pacific Islands. And I do see multiple disaster program managers or specialists or employees that is on the call. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know um, it takes, you know, for your time to join us. And I think sometimes it does make a difference when we have a pay staff to join us, to give us support, and also to see that what we're experiencing as volunteers and what roadblocks we're experiencing. So I'm very excited for you all to join us. Um, do we have any other questions? Oh, so we have a question from Connie says, does anyone know how long the SRT were deployed for the fires that occurred in the Rogue Valley a few years ago. So I I will I don't know how long that they were deployed out there, um, but I'm going to share this piece of information. What SRT is today is not what SRT was even a year ago. So it's it's a progression of a product that's improved on. So if you did SRT a couple years ago or are familiar with it from a couple years ago, it is the new and improved SRT. That's always great to hear. We're always improving. That's great to hear. Um, we have a lot of thank yous, Cynthia, for a great presentation. Do we have any other questions? We still have four minutes left. I would like to just tap on the CMIST question. Um, we in, in Hurricane um, Ida in Houma, Louisiana, they used local nurses to fill out the CMIST forms because there wasn't enough health services. So there are times that it's not just IDC. So what I was referring to is like whoever the assigned person is to fill that out. So I have another question said from Candace said, who is the SRT for San Bernardino snow disaster? Need phone numbers. Oi. I don't know, but uh, I'll, I'll find out and get back to you, Kenna. Um, I can answer that. And if it, if that is a DRO, then it will be in the IAP. And if you don't know how to get to the IAP, I will drop a link in chat. It may not be a above a level two yet financially, okay. though. So it may it might not have triggered SRT, but you can always, always talk to your RDO and ask for it if you see a need for it. Um, the level three is a consideration that's always on the table by um, the um, by national that they would consider funding that. So if you see a need, don't be afraid to take it, take it up and ask for it. Cause you never know. Worst they can say is no and you already have no, right? Thank you so much. And I love Melissa for jumping to tell us that, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the the dog portal and, you know, it's basically exactly we, we, what we touched on last time, which is the incident action plan. And like Cynthia th said, and multiple people put in the chat is that when it's a level two, meaning that it's a local disaster, we usually do not have a shelter resident transition team. And um, Cynthia, we have one more question. And, you know, the skills that we're talking about, the skill set, is it transferable and applicable to our local community? say that if it's a homeless you know population or whatnot good question um yes um everything that i personally have learned in srt i've brought back to my community i apply it on a national basis across the country from here to florida but i work tirelessly with our boads and our external relations and with our um, homeless organizations to try to be in a ready state because I see what not being in a ready state means after a disaster. If we have an earthquake, um, we are all deploying locally because the earthquake would likely affect um, many of us across the states or a, a state. And I think being in a more ready state by having those relationships with the homeless organizations and the external VOADs, I think that's just so, so important to success um, just for your community in a disaster. 
Thank you so much, Cynthia. And I do not feel like I'm the only moderator. And I just love how people are just, you know, when you were talking VOAD, I was about to type and it was putting on VOAD equals two. And I saw that's coming already. So everyone beat me to You're it. You're amazing. Okay, Cynthia, amazing. before we close, we have one more minute. And what would something be like, you know, one piece of word or advice that you will leave to the group as in, if someone is interested in SRT, why would you know why would they want to do SRT instead of let's say casework or why would they want to do SRT instead of sheltering or what is one of the biggest piece that you love SRT so much what what is your love and why you love SRT so much well I learned from you all um, what compassion means I see you and I witness I hear you and I, I see you nurturing the families and the people in the shelters and I take that and I apply that to that one-on-one -on -one casework that I can do and it, it's very um, for, for an SRT person it's very compassionate but it's also very emotional work so you have to really want to dig in and really want to have the um, wherewithal to walk through this time with the clients. And it may be a short time. You may only get two weeks to make a difference in that person's life. Um, but if you choose to do it, the, the rewards of that one-on-one -on -one activity that helps a client move out onto their own is a replication of the thousands of people who are letting you be there all of the volunteers that stayed home so that they would answer the DAT call so that you could go to Kentucky and answer a call for a tornado. Everybody's working together so that one interaction can happen and it is just so rewarding. So if you like computers and you like that one-on-one -on -one interaction and that deep casework, um, I say go for it. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for presenting. I look forward to seeing you all next week. We're going to talk about promotion process. It's really one of my, you know, most interesting, exciting topic that we're going to talk about next week. And thank you so much all for joining and for your contributions. And thank you for Melissa for putting all the links and everyone else for joining and putting links. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you, Yiwei. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.